the maintenance of international peace and security. Today, we should reiterate this, the key principles are in the UN Charter, and we, of course, need to seek to uphold the mandate that was conferred upon us in this context. What we see is that it is the poorest and most vulnerable states which would suffer the most if our confidence in the international system should waver. I mentioned the United Nations Charter. That is a cornerstone of public international law. This year, it is the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This is a unique opportunity to reiterate the global consensus enshrined in this declaration. So this is a key point in time to unify and to strengthen the international community. The United Nations, indeed, are the bedrock of peaceful cooperation and mutual trust between states. And I believe there's no doubt these challenges cannot really be overcome through isolated initiatives. Our action has to be joint action. It must be collective action. I'd like to talk now about combating inequalities. Strong multilateral institutions are crucial for combating inequalities, which unfortunately are always exacerbated in crises. Climate change also exacerbates social inequalities and economic inequalities. These inequalities spike not only between countries, but also within countries whether we're talking about social inequalities, gender inequalities, or economic disparities. I was struck to read recently that over the past 20 years, over the past 20 years, the income back uh, income back rather between the 10% of richest people and the 50% poorest people has doubled. I was also struck when I read recently that inequalities today are as stark as they were at the beginning of the 20th century before the First World War. Inequalities still in a disproportionate manner affect those who are already the most vulnerable in our societies. Inequalities foster in instability and populism. Inequality leads to a loss of trust in institutions and in democracy. This vulnerability is a threat to each and every one of us there, both domestically speaking within our countries and internationally. For a long time now, probably for too long, we have believed that defending our interests and protecting the most vulnerable are two different things. We know today that you can't have one without the other. Now, in terms of promoting peace, excellencies, strong multilateral institutions are also crucial here. We have some things that we can focus on together. The new agenda for peace of the Secretary General that stresses a particularly important point, namely that prevention, prevention, I reiterate, is the starting point for, point for all peace efforts. Inequalities of access, inequality of opportunity in terms of food, healthcare, employment, property, these lead to conflicts. We need to do everything that we can to ensure that each and every person in each country can fully participate in political, economic, social and cultural life in their countries. Threats, persecution, acts of violence, those in particular targeting women, in particular those people who are there to defend human rights, all of these need to be resolutely combated. Young people need to have real prospects for development and for prosperity as well. I talked about inequalities, I talked about promoting peace. There's also a key role to be played by multilateral institutions to protect civilians. All armed conflicts are different. However, the common denominator in all of them is an exacerbation of inequality, suffering, and civilian suffering in particular. Thus, strong multilateral institutions are key, including the respect for international humanitarian law. That's a top priority for Switzerland. That respect is at the heart of Switzerland's work within the Security Council. And in this discussion, in this debate, I'd like to remind you that the protection of civilians in armed conflicts is not an option. It is an obligation for all parties to a conflict. Over the past year, I had the opportunity on several occasions to go to countries affected by conflict, in particular to Mozambique and the Democratic Republic of Congo and also Colombia. These contacts with the people affected by conflict highlights the extent to which work on the root causes of conflict is crucial in terms of guaranteeing lasting peace. I was also able to see on the ground the extent to which the full participation of women is crucial to bring a return to peace. This is why my country, Switzerland, is continuing its strong commitment to implement the Women, Peace and Security Agenda of the United Nations. This is also why we are continuing to mobilise to ensure the full implementation of all pertinent resolutions here. During armed conflict, the shortage of essential goods and services for civilians costs many more lives than the direct impact of hostilities does. It also exacerbates inequalities and undermines peace returning. In this context, I'd like to stress to you the importance of UN peacekeeping missions. They carry out essential work for the worst affected populations. And in this context, I think that all humanitarian stakeholders should be protected and supported. You, there are also other stakeholders as well as UN missions. And so in this context, the commitment of the ICRC needs to be strongly defended. The increasing number of crises means that the organization has had to deal with an unprecedented spike in, and a worrisome spike in needs. We're the depository of the Geneva Conventions and we are the um, headquarters of the ICRC. And so Switzerland is resolutely committed to this humanitarian work. The work of the ICRC is crucial for protection of civilians. Ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, I have cited a few examples and we see that there are numerous huge challenges. We need to see where are our common interests, not certainly in global disorder, that some people are trying to promote to their gain, but rather in a renewed global order that guarantees stability, trust and shared objectives. This is precisely why we need to take a stance. This is precisely why we need to undertake to ensure that this international cooperation thrives. The United Nations doesn't come from nowhere. It embodies the hope, the institutionalized hope of a better world. It was an idealistic project. It was born during a different time of war, of brutality and despair. And it is based on the belief that Cooperating at the international level is crucial. It is based on the belief that the world can only be better if each and every person shoulders their responsibilities. And it is based on the belief that ultimately what unites nations and what unites people is much, much stronger than that which separates them. 
This should make us optimistic in a period where there's a lot of pessimism, but this should encourage us not only to strengthen, but also step up our work together at the global level. With this General Assembly, we have a unique opportunity, a rare opportunity to come together to display trust and together to prepare for the Summit of the Future in 2024, to strengthen cooperation on key matters, to address any shortcomings in global governance and to reaffirm existing commitments. This is in particular the case for the 2030 Agenda. It is very interesting to be able to participate in the discussions yesterday. And the SDG Summit that did indeed take place yesterday should give us an opportunity to breathe new life into this agenda because it is nothing less than our shared roadmap for a better future for us all. Let us show responsibility and solidarity to build a fairer, more egalitarian, world for not us so much but for those who are going to come after us for future generations and we must say this this is a responsibility that we have to shoulder it can't be delegated this is our responsibility thank you on behalf of the assembly i wish to thank the president of the swiss confederation for the statement just made and i request protocol to escort his excellency the assembly will now hear an address by her excellency natasha purse musar president of the republic of slovenia i ask protocol to escort her excellency on behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome Her Excellency Natasha Pirk Musar, President of the Republic of Slovenia, and I invite her to address this assembly. Ladies and gentlemen, Your Excellencies, Mr. President, let me first congratulate you on your election as the President of the 78th Session of the General Assembly. It is truly a great honor to address you for the first time as the President of Slovenia. You leave this institution in the most challenging of times, times such as have not been seen, not been seen since, since the establishment of the United Nations. I will return to this point again later. We live in a world in which various actors, including private companies and individuals, affect international relations at all levels and across sovereign boundaries. It is a world that has changed demographically and technologically. It is a world in which human dignity is still not guaranteed for all and is increasingly challenged for the most marginalized and vulnerable people. It is a world with a set of normative commitments, including legally binding treaties, which are not being implemented. It is a world where there are many wars, deadly conflicts, aggressions against states, and the suffering of many civilians who fear for their lives or are affected by the socioeconomic destruction caused by conflicts. It is a world that has not universally recognized the seriousness of the climate change unfolding before our eyes. It is a world that lacks global solidarity for the implementation of the development goals that we all have committed to. It is a world that needs the United Nations with a reformed representative security council that will be able to respond to all of the mentioned challenges effectively and in an adequate and fair manner. We should tackle these challenges as one. If we continue to prioritize national interests, private interests, or just some particularistic interests of individual actors and leave the resolution of global problems on the sidelines, we will extinguish ourselves as a civilization. In this context, I would like to briefly touch upon four issues that call for the attention of all of us and which require that we all adopt and implement appropriate measures. Climate change, Security Council reform, the pitfalls of the digital age, and of course, gender equality. On climate change, it may sound like a cliche to say that we need to abandon the business as usual mentality, but it is not a cliche. Business as usual is not working. It is failing us all. Climate change is the greatest challenge of our time. The catastrophic floods that hit Slovenia in August are just one more event among the many, many events around the world that prove the point. I trust that we will be able to overcome the consequences of the floods. But think of countries that have less capacity to do so. Think of small island developing states, for example. They are frequent victims of catastrophic natural disasters, but the recovery costs are disproportionately high. Everyone should invest in an environmentally sustainable world, but I want to be clear, not everyone equally. Global solidarity is a matter of climate justice. Intergovernmental solidarity, with richer states contributing more than the poorer ones, and with the richest private companies also contributing their fair share, must be guided by the understanding that climate change is a result of human activities, past and present. Therefore, I am pleased to announce that Slovenia plans to increase its contribution to the Global Climate Fund by 50%. Addressing the growing financing gap between the needs of developing countries and available financial resources is essential for the implementation of Agenda 2030. However, I am very concerned that the current geopolitical polarization is hindering collaborative climate action. I only wish that in such circumstances, scientists were listened to more. According to the IPCC, simply keeping our promises would already be a step in the right direction. Sustainable development must become our joint and purposeful goal and principle guiding everyone's behavior. We must integrate climate action as well as the related question of water and food security in, into conflict prevention, conflict resolution, and sustainable peace building. Slovenia continues to be actively involved in ensuring climate and environmental justice, including the right to a clean and healthy environment, and in securing equitable access to safe drinking water and sanitation for all. During the UN 2023 Water Conference, I emphasized, water is life, water is existence, water is peace. It is for this reason that I would like to use this opportunity to repeat our call for the establishment of an UN Special Envoy on Water, which will be an important step towards ensuring the better coherence of water efforts inside and outside the United Nations. Mr. President, on the 6th of June 2023, Slovenia was elected to serve as a non-permanent member of the UN Security Council for the period 2024-2025. I would like to use this opportunity to thank you all for your confidence in electing my country to serve on Council. It is with great honor, profound humility, and a sense of shared responsibility that we assume this task. Our term will be carried out in response to numerous con conversations and exchanges we had with member states during our campaign. With regards to the Security Council, I cannot avoid the discussions on its reform, which have been going on for decades. 
I truly hope that we will soon see the light at the end of the tunnel. Slovenia has always been among the member states claiming that a change in composition of permanent and non-permanent membership is long overdue. The current distribution of seats in the Security Council is neither fair nor representative. Furthermore, Slovenia belongs to the majority of member states that are deeply concerned about the unlimited use of the veto power, which is causing us to lose faith in the Security Council. It also results in the Security Council failing to act when action is required. In Europe, we view Ukraine as a case in point. Even some permanent member states have suggested that the P5 should refrain from using the veto, at least in the case of mass atrocities. We are all seeing this most valid suggestion ignored. In this regard, we commend Liechtenstein's recently introduced veto initiative as an important invitation to the P5 to reflect thoroughly on the situation before resorting to a veto. At the same time, it needs to be recalled that the UN Charter itself gives the P5 an opportunity to express their displeasure with decision-making, but still to act responsibly. They may, they may not like a draft resolution, but they can choose to abstain and let the UN pursue without interruption its main goal, to maintain peace and security for all, not for merely a few, and certainly not just for one. Excellencies, by losing trust, we attack the very foundations of organized society of our international community. I'm afraid that in our digital age, part of the problem of losing trust lies with the science and technology. Inventions are meant to advance humanity. Social media were not invented to disconnect us, but too often they do exactly that. Artificial intelligence can be useful, but can, it can also be dangerous. In this regard, I, I applaud to Secretary General's resolve to form a high-level advisory body on artificial intelligence. We need to find a way to govern the development of new technologies, including artificial intelligence, in a way that does not impede economic, developmental, social, and research opportunities, while not putting us at risk. A human-centric and human rights-based approach to the full life cycle of technologies, comprising their design, development, and application, as well as decline, should be the answer. The Global Digital Compact must be centered on this notion. Things can be done, but all actors, including private companies, will need to be on board with honest and meaningful, meaningful commitment. Ensuring that human rights are the foundation of an open, safe digital future is not going to be an easy task. In saying so, I look at the key meanings of our time, disinformation. Unfortunately, our time is once again a time of competing of narratives, only that now they are much more complex as regards the threat they pose to humanity. It is an era of snack news, attention economy, the fabrication of facts, and of increasing disagreements about facts precisely because we no longer trust any narratives. We may have the freedom of information, but we are not protected against false information, manipulation, and deceit. Mr. Secretary General is to the point in referring to the proliferation of hate and lies in the digital space as grave global harm. Big tech companies should take more systematic responsibility for the content they host and moderate. They should better protect users from hate speech, disinformation, and other harmful online content. What is unacceptable offline should not be acceptable online. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm about to say a few words on a subject so important that I have saved it, saved it for the last part of my address, gender equality. This year, we are celebrating the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It saddens me that today we are still facing the fact that half of the world's population, women and girls, experience inequality, exclusion, and even brutal violence. The societal marginalization of women and girls, often coupled with poverty, a lack of opportunities, to receive quality education and exclusion from labor markets and decision-making processes is not only unjust. It also results in a monumental waste of potential for our societies. To ensure dignity for everyone, including women and girls, we all must pursue this goal, whether in the West or East, the North or South, or anywhere in between. We should start at home, also in our United Nations home. In this regard, I would like to recall an outstanding detail that illustrates the need to take SDG goal number five very seriously. Namely, that it will take 140 years to achieve the equal representation of women in leadership positions in the workplace. This is simply unacceptable. The Secretary General agrees. The achievement of women's full, equal, and meaningful participation in political and public life is part of his new agenda for peace. That is why I am very much in favor of initiatives to achieve this objective, including within the framework of the United Nations. On this particular point, I'm, thank I'm thinking of the initiative from the group of Women Leaders Voices for Change and Inclu Inclusion concerning the alternation of the gender of the presidency of the UN General Assembly. Mr. President, you are presiding over an assembly of the most important global institution. We are all painfully aware of the fact that hitherto only four, only four presidents of the General Assembly have been women. Only four in its entire history. 74 were men. We should live up to our own declarations on gender equality and materialize them in the work of the General Assembly as well. This would be a vivid and symbolic way of demonstrating our joint commitment. Excellencies, as I leave this podium, I would like to reaffirm the need for multilater multilateralism. This needs to be a different type of multilateralism, one that is effective and inclusive, making the UN an actor and a forum fully fit for the future. The most pressing challenges today, and I have elaborated on some of them, cannot be addressed by individual states, no matter their size or power. This must be a collective effort, or our children and grandchildren will be affected much more than the generation of leaders gathered here. We must work towards a new global compact, which needs to be principled, rise above particularistic interest, and be based on global solidarity. It needs to prioritize the protection of nature and human dignity. It also needs to have a long horizon. 
Slovenia is fully committed to contributing to the pact for the future, and we look forward to actively engaging in the upcoming summit next year. We must be ambitious, even if do not agree on solutions to all the emerging challenges. We need to use our power and resources to put all our collective efforts into action in order to solve them. Better one by one than none. Thank you very much, Your Excellencies and ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the General Assembly, I thank the President of the Republic of Slovenia for the statement that she has made, and I would uh, ask the protocol to escort Her Excellency. The Assembly will now hear a statement by His Excellency Shavkat Mirzoyev, President of the Republic of Uzbekistan. I, would, I request protocol to escort His Excellency. On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome His Excellency Shavkat Mirzoyev. Distinguished Mr. President, distinguished Secretary General, heads of delegations, ladies and gentlemen. Today's session of the United Nations General Assembly is taking place in the context of fundamental changes in the system of international relations. There is a global crisis of confidence. Problems in the functioning of global security institutions and deviation from international law are increasing. All this is causing a huge increase in tension. The geopolitical contradictions are creating new obstacles to the free flow of trade, investment, and innovation. Even on the issues that concern the fate of humanity as a whole, such as climate change, hunger, and inequality, one can feel that mutual communication has been lost. In such a com complex situation, the idea of preserving the spirit of practical cooperation and interaction, placing common interests above existing conflicts and strengthening unity among countries is becoming more relevant than ever. Last year, we launched the Samarkand Solidarity Initiative aimed at common security and development. Our main goal is as follows, to comprehensively understand the responsibility for the present and future of our countries and peoples, to engage in a global dialogue all parties that are ready for open and constructive cooperation. I am confident that holding a summit of the future next year at the initiative of the UN Secretary General will serve to address the current challenges of international and regional development, increase the influence and effectiveness of our organization. Dear participants of the Assembly, we remain committed to continuing our policy of creating new Uzbekistan, which is a low-governed, secular, democratic and social state. Our country is boldly pursuing the path of fundamental reforms and strengthening the principles of democracy and justice based on the noble idea of in the name of human values and interests. In April this year, for the first time in the history of Uzbekistan, a nationwide...